Welcome back to Learn SKN, and today we're gonna start our MOB Management of Business for Cape. We're gonna start the lecture series for that subject. So that's just basically the upgraded version of POB from CSEC Principles of Business from CXC. But of course, there are some key differences in terms of the depth of in which certain topic areas are covered. And you can see reflected in the examination. So let's just look at an example here. So you have the 2016 CAPE exam, paper two for unit one. And as you can see, you have this paper consists of three sections, A, B, and C. Each section consists of, consists of two questions. Candidates must answer one question from each section. And then of course we have the same 2016, but this time the principles of business paper. And you can see that the instructions answer the three questions in section one, answer the three questions in section one, one in section two, and one in section three, as indicated. Each question is worth 20 marks. And so that's a very key difference right there. Each question is worth 20 marks, whereas for the CAPE, each question is worth 25 marks. And you have to do three of them. So you have to choose one from section a, one from B, and one from C, and each of them contain two. And so the real difference is the length in which you have to explain and discuss certain things. Look at these marks here. So you have a two marker right here, a two marker right there. But then it goes all the way up to a nine marker, and then a 12 mark question. So you have to discuss for a, for a full 12 marks. Whereas for CISEC, of course, you're going to break them down into smaller bite-sized pieces for students to consume. So you have a two marker right there. Then you have a four marks here. You have a four marks there. You have a four marks there. And the highest you might get is a six marks question. And so that you don't have to retain as much information, if I can put it like that, to put back out on a paper in CISEC as you have to in CAPE. So some of the topics I said might be similar, but you go more in-depth. And so you have to look at discussions and you have to be a little bit more versatile. You have to be a little more broad with the explanations, you know, giving exam, I mean, advantages, disadvantages, comparisons in the real world, things like that. So this is one of the key differences, the way in which you have to present the content. It's not, not shallow and so you have no of any questions. You have to be a little bit more articulate, a little more in depth with some of the answers that you are given. So those are some of the key differences where, as it relates to CAPE and CISEC when you look at business subjects, right? So that's what we're going to look at. We're going to jump into CAPE just now. So we're going to start with, of course, section unit one, module one, business and its environment. And today we're going to look at just one. We look at just type of economic activity. So we're going to look at the types of economic activities. And of course, we know in POB, you have the primary, secondary. You just have to basically list them and then you know, maybe a little definition, but that's about it. But here you have to go a little more in depth, as I said before. Now, the textbook we're going to be using is the Management of Business for Cape Examinations by Jerome Peterson. That's the textbook we are going to be using. And of course, you can purchase that from the Macmillan ebook uh, website. So that's what we're going to be using. So we're going to jump right into the first part of the of unit one, module one the business and its environment. So we're looking at module one again, economic and legal structures. And so the first one, we know that there are three different levels of, of, of production from our POB days. We know we have primary, secondary, and tertiary. And so we're gonna look at them more in depth as it relates to MOB now. So the primary sector incorporates all the ex extractive industries, including mining, for example, bauxite, fishing, forestry, and farming. In most cases, the products of the primary sector are raw materials that are used for the secondary production. For example, bauxite is used for manufacturing aluminum and lumber is used for building of furniture and houses. The primary sector also includes the fishing and agricultural industry. And so we know that from all of us in the Caribbean, we know that the primary sector played a major role in the, in the early days of most of the Caribbean countries. Some still, like Dominica for example, the, the agricultural sector still contributes majorly to the country's GDP, the gross domestic product. But in other islands, we have moved further away from primary 
sector more into the tertiary or the services. So, like I said, our history is based in the primary sector simply because of sl uh, sugar production, slavery, and that kind of thing. So, you know that most of the Caribbean countries were dedicated to sugar production. You had Jamaica, you had who still, you know, on a large scale uh, produces sugar, Guyana, Cuba. But for some of the small islands, you know, the Oasis Islands, some of the Windward Islands, sugar and agriculture on a whole has been replaced by the services except mainly for Dominica and Grenada to some extent. They still rely on, well, more, they rely more on the agricultural sector or the extractive sector than some of the other countries. Yes, Jamaica and Trinidad and Guyana too have large extractive industries because remember it includes mining and those kind of things and so you, know, you have bauxite and gold and oil and those things in these larger islands but the reality is for some of these islands the 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 resources kind of belong to foreign entities and so the country on a whole doesn't really benefit from a lot of these extractive sector activities a lot of this stuff a lot of the, the proceeds go back to a foreign land so that way you know the gdp might look a certain way but when you look at the GNP, it might be less because a lot of the factors of production are owned by foreign entities. And so we know that the extractive industry doesn't really help with the, with the development of a lot of the countries in the Caribbean. I mean, the reality is we should go back to that because of, you know, what COVID did to the Caribbean. You know, tourism took a major hit. We're going to explain later on when we reach a tertiary level. And so let's continue reading. Some Caribbean countries are heavily dependent on primary level activities in order to earn foreign exchange. Currently, some countries export large amounts of raw materials in their natural state instead of exploring the production that could be produced by using those same resources. And so let's look at some advantages and disadvantages of, you know, depending too, much, too heavily on the primary sector or the extractive industry. Advantages. The country is able to supply raw materials to firms for conversion. And as I said, that you see that happening. You provide gold, you provide, not gold, but the, 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 the ores, and you provide the, you know, for aluminum industry, for the petrochemical industry, even for cement industry, when it provides some of the limestone and things like that. So you provide the raw materials. The country can gain a comparative advantage over others in producing certain goods. So, uh, for example, you know, some countries have a comparative advantage, you know, you for those of who did economics, where they produce certain things more efficiently than other countries. For example, you, you can see Gr Grenada. Grenada produces some high quality, some high quality spices, you know, in nutmeg and whatnot. Jamaica produces some high quality turmeric and ginger. Those are, you know, world renowned. Some other countries, I mean, Trinidad and Tobago, they produce, you know, a lot of the petrochemical, petrochemical chemicals and things like that that are used by major corporations. Guyana, very, very rich in natural resources because they have a la large land, land base and things like that. And so, you know, Guyana can produce certain things better than other countries, even in the region. So comparative advantage refers to a country being able to produce certain things more efficiently than other countries. Small countries, you know, small islands, they are not very comparative. They don't have a comparative advantage for certain things. For example, sugar. That's one of the reasons why some of the smaller islands like St. Kitts came out of the sugar industry because sugar requires a large land space, a large land mass, and smaller islands cannot really be competitive when they're producing sugar. Because larger islands like Brazil and even in the Caribbean, you have Cuba can produce sugar with a, a with, with a comparative advantage more efficiently than the smaller islands. They have to focus on something else. Like for example, again Grenada with the nutmeg, and you know Jamaica with the ginger and the turmeric and certain um, tubers, and also you have the certain coffee coffee brands, the Blue Mountain Coffee that Jamaica produces as world renowned. And so again, other advantages create jobs generation of export revenues a lot of these things we export and we earn income from that as a country and of course the agriculture sector even though it contributes a little bit to a majority of the island's gdp when it as it relates to labor and jobs a lot of persons work in the 
extractive industry, especially agriculture, because you have the farmer, you have the hucksters on the road selling the things, you have agro processing and stuff like that. So it creates jobs. But some disadvantages, depletion of natural resources, especially because of exploitation. And that's obvious. Some of them are non-renewable resources. Most of the the gas and oil and those things are non-renewable. And so eventually they're going to be depleted and what happens to that country? So they have to, what you have to do now is you have to save up the money for a rainy day in some, in some you know, sovereign fund or something so that you, know, you don't have problems when time comes and the resources are depleted. They are not infinite, they are finite, and so eventually they'll be, deplete, they'll be depleted and you're going to have problems with that. Potential to earn more revenue if raw materials were to be converted into finished products. Like I said before, a lot of this stuff, like for example in Jamaica, Trinidad, Guyana, a lot of the major extractive industries are owned by foreign entities. And so they are the ones who would process these things and earn higher revenue, earn higher value because they're turning them into value added products. So you're gonna take the ore and turn it into the aluminum and sell that to the, the car industry or whatever. But you are going to get more money when you process and sell these goods, these value added products. A lot of the, for farming for example, the farmer, when you look at the supply chain, you know, from the farm all the way down to a shelf, a store shelf, or a product in a can or a bottle, the farmer earns the least amount of money along that supply chain. The farmer himself or herself earns the least amount of money along that supply chain. A lot of the persons who earn most of the income would be the store owners, the processors, and other people like that. So the persons in the extractive industry are now often at the bottom of earnings as it relates to the supply chain for all, all of those, the value chain, sorry, the value chain for all those products, the value chain. So yeah, so you earn less at the bottom than of course at the top. And so if we as a, Car as a Caribbean were able to take those same things that we extract, process them, make them into value added products, then we will earn a lot more revenue from our overall extractive sector because we sell the raw materials to other entities to process into finished value-added goods. And so, of course, that's a disadvantage right there. Then we have the decrease in the demand for finished products will decrease the demand for primary products and so reduce revenue. So, based on the... Let's say people stop, a lot of people going towards more electric vehicles now. The EV is basically taking over. So, you know, in the future, there will be a decrease in the demand for petrochemicals. And so, you know, countries in the Caribbean that rely on these things, they are going to, the, the revenues are going to fall because nobody's going to be demanding the oil and natural gas and stuff for much longer. For The oil in particular for their car and the gasoline and things like that because everybody going to electric vehicles and so that's a risk that you 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 have and that's a disadvantage right there because if you rely too much on it then when the demand falls your bottom line is going to be impacted heavily if you look back at like i said back in our history where the caribbean was basically the the ones who planted the cane manif i mean reaped the cane harvest the cane and then it was sent overseas, the sugar was sent overseas to, you know, to be sold on other markets. We basically took the hit for that one. Because like I said, the value added product, the sugar cane, the rum, all those things are what sold. Those are what you have the higher margins in. And that is why none of the Caribbean islands have been developed fully from agriculture or from sugar cane. Because we were basically, well, slavery was a thing. And so we were the labor and that's about it. And because we were the labor, we were not able to take advantage of the value added products. And so we're not able to develop any further than we are now. And so it's, it's very difficult to depend solely on extractive if we're not going to go to the higher levels in the value chain. So, so those are some disadvantages of the primary. But for the most part, if we manage them properly, then we know reliance on it. We, do, we should. I mean, the reality is, no country should rely too much, too much on one sector, because all sectors have their faults, their advantages and disadvantages. You have to, you have to have, to have a mix. But of course, in the Caribbean, we've gone too far on the service spectrum. So the second one 
is the secondary sector. The secondary sector includes the changing of raw materials into finished goods. It incorporates the manufacturing and the construction industry. Examples of secondary businesses activities include the manufacture of chemicals and of big products and the construction of houses, roadways, and bridges. So the secondary sector is all about construction and manufacturing. And of course, they would get their own materials from the primary sector. And there are a lot of famous companies in the Caribbean who engage in the primary, secondary sector. And so they have some listed here. The Caribbean has a number of businesses that take the raw materials produced in the region and convert them to finished products. For example, Trinidad Cement Company and Grace Kennedy Jamaica. You know, Grace makes a lot, a lot of products, a lot of, a lot of sauce and a lot of, you know, canned goods and things like that, that they took from the primary sector. And so again, like I said, that's the advantage they'll have with the value added products. While the trading of primary products is important, secondary sector products are usually in higher demand. That's a finished product. Nobody wants to go and actually make their own bread from the wheat that they grew. That's too much work, you know? So they just want to go in the store, pick up the finished bread, and then move on. A dynamic manufacturing firm can take one primary product and create a number of secondary products which will generate greater revenues for itself. For example, a firm could use banana to make banana chips, banana milkshake, banana bread, banana flavored soft drinks, banana porridge mix, and banana fritters. And of course, those of us who lived in Jamaica, we know that, you know, JP makes a lot of different banana products. Then you have places like Separate and those other companies that make a lot of products from milk and all kind of other raw materials and so that is where a lot of the money comes in from the the value added products the struggle for some caribbean countries is that they are not able to make best use of their primary products by converting them into secondary products and that's what we just discussed earlier some advantages of being involved in the secondary sector so let's just go through them and explain them best from one from top to the bottom Reduction in the importation of goods that are produced using the same raw materials from the Caribbean. And if you, if you, for those of us, for those, those of us who live in the small islands, we know that when you look in the supermarket, a lot of the products, the produce, the products in there are made by other companies overseas. A lot of American-based companies, maybe Mexican-based companies. You have the Goyas and your Del Montes and the Nestle's and all those companies. But for those of who live in Jamaica or Trinidad, you go into a store and you see some of the domestic brands ruling the, ruling the store. You have your, your Holiday, you have your Pine Hill, you have your Grace. So you have a lot of domestic brands basically can, you know, ruling the domestic market, which is a good thing. So that makes those companies basically self-sufficient in certain things. And so they are not going to be importing all those goods. They are going to be using what they have locally. In Jamaica, again, you have a lot of high production in pork, in milk, in chicken, in vegetables, even snacks. And so a lot of them are domestic brands. And that would reduce the importation bill and the importation of foreign brands. And of course, you earn foreign exchange from the product that are exported. Again, Pine Hill, exported throughout the Caribbean. Holiday Snacks, exported throughout the Caribbean. Sunshine, throughout the Caribbean. Grace, throughout the Caribbean and Americas. So you earn foreign exchange when you're able to take raw materials and turn them into finished products and then you export them, you earn your foreign currency that way. One major product that can be, one primary product can be used to create a number of secondary products as we said above when we were explaining the banana. You can take banana, make banana chips, banana bread, banana drinks, banana sodas, banana, banana everything. Right? So you can take that one thing and diversify it and earn a lot more revenue from that one product. So you see a lot of, per, a lot of you go in Jamaica, you have a lot of different hot sauce out there, a lot of different brands of it, sauce all over, different brands, different names, all from the one, especially Scott Bonnet Pepper. So that's the next thing right there. Creation of jobs in different areas other than extractive industry. So now the manufacturing and the construction industry has boomed because 
you are taking raw materials, manufacturing them, and so you can create jobs at different areas, different aspects. You can people can specialize in different parts of the value chain, not just the planting and the harvesting or, or things like that. You have in you have things like gold, are you to gold, jewelry? So you have people who actually make the jewelry, people who sell the jewelry, things like that. And so you create a lot of different jobs within the secondary sector of the economy, not just the extractive. A lot of different um, professional professions can arise. A lot of different skills and techniques will be needed. A lot of, so you go out and study various things, you know, food processing, you know, um, when, the goal, when the resources are mined, you have to be able to convert them into different products and you have, you know, more people in those areas. So, of course, because you are engaged fully in the manufacturing or the construction, again, different jobs. In construction alone, you have so many different jobs in construction. Mason, carpenter, joiner, a lot of different jobs. Contractors, engineers have a lot of jobs being created in that sector alone. So, that helps to, you know, reduce unemployment. Then, possible increase in investment in manufacturing sector. Now, because you realize that, okay, we have a booming uh, manufacturing industry, of course, they're going to bring in a lot of investment. And again, I said it before, a lot of the companies that run the extractive industry are foreigners, and they invest in that in order to get the finished product, the raw material to turn it into a finished product. A lot of companies uh, does what you call, do what you call the vertical, vertical, you have a vertical chain where they own the primary and also the secondary and a lot of companies they own their own primary resource and then they also own the secondary manufacturing and also uh construction side of things like for example some company like grace i know grace would have persons who actually produce your farms who actually work for grace you have farms that actually produce banana and different things for, you know, JP and other companies like that. You have Pine Hill, of course, they can contract out. They have their own farm, dairy farms, so they can have their milk. And so you have what we call vertical integration. That's the word I'm looking for, vertical integration. A lot of companies do that. A lot of uh, people who do chicken and pork, they actually own chicken farms, pig farms, and you have vertical integration. So they invest in the manufacturing sector and it goes both ways because some persons who own the farm actually do own their own production outfits to do their milk and do their yogurt and things like that so yeah so, so you, you invest more in the manufacturing sector because you know there's a possibility right there improvement in the country's gross domestic product and so possible its standard of living again because you're not importing as much a lot of the monies stay on, on the ground in the island and show up among the citizens. And so that would mean that the overall standard of living for the country should improve because you're not sending out the money anymore. Like I said before, because of, of slavery and we are colonized, all of the monies used to go, used to go out of the islands. So we grow the sugar cane, we get our, our, our salary, our wages for just the growing, but all of the money goes outside of the country because it's not owned by that country anymore but when you engage in the secondary sector the secondary production money stays within the economy within the country and so that can improve the overall standard of living for persons but of course you have some downsides to you know involvement in the secondary sector one the profit motive of manufacturing firms could lead to depletion of some primary resources a number of manufacturing companies are often multinationals which repatriate their funds instead of reinvesting in the country as we said before so we don't have to go through that we went through that already some of the raw materials used in secondary sector have to be imported and this uses of foreign exchange earnings for the country so let's let's, let's let's break it down first one the profit motive of manufacturing firms can lead to depletion of some primary products so what they're saying here is that because they're making so much money from the secondary industry, they are going to force persons to produce more and more and more of the raw material and eventually deplete that source. For example, if oil price go up, of course you're going to force the the oil wells and pumps to produce more barrels per day, more barrels per day to get that money when it's high because you want to get maximize the profit. So eventually that would lead to the depletion of those reserves. 
same thing with any um, crop production. A lot of people might force the farmers to do engage in monoculture. And you know, monoculture, monocropping can exhaust the soil. Also can lead to, you know, the soil getting all messed up because you're going to use a lot of insecticides and herbicides and those things. So you're basically going to reduce the overall productivity and fertility of the soil if you go too hard into that form of agriculture. So that is one disadvantage right there. They're going to deplete the natural resource. Look at Brazil. Because they want to produce more and more beef to feed the beef market. They're actually burning down the Amazon rainforest. Right? They burn down the Amazon rainforest to make room for more cattle products and things like that to produce more pork, more beef. And so you have problems right there. The economic, the economic and the environmental impact is grave. And so you don't want to be too greedy and then you destroy the natural primary resources. So that's a disadvantage right there. And like I said before, a number of manufacturing companies are often multinationals, meaning they have their branches overseas, and so they send back all the money that they make back to the parent company, back to the headquarters, and a lot of it doesn't stay within the country, and so that's a major disadvantage. And I said before, I gave you the example of sugarcane, colonization, all the money going back to Europe. That is why our Caribbean countries are still where they are today. Because a lot of the monies, the, the, the proceeds from agriculture, sugarcane, was going back to England. And so we have that problem right there. And there are some of the raw materials used in the secondary industry sector have to be imported. Again, if you are engaging in construction or manufacturing, some of the raw materials you need for these endeavors, you have to import. And of course, that's going to hit your foreign exchange uh, account hard so the country gonna you're gonna earn some you know by producing but you have to minus the expense of importing and so that would all affect your overall GNP so that's another disadvantage right there and the last thing we're gonna cover today is the tertiary sector the tertiary sector does not produce goods but instead provides services over the last decade the Caribbean business environment has become more service oriented some of these services include tourism, financial services, transportation, and management services. In recent times, in recent times, the tertiary sector has become one of the main contributors to the Caribbean countries. Gross domestic product, with tourism being the most popular. We have seen improvements in the banking sector, transportation insurance, telecommunications, courier services, and money services, among others. So again, tertiary, you're not producing anything, it's a service. And so... Off the bat, we can tell what the disadvantages are. This book was written before COVID, and so we know how hard the Caribbean has been hit by reliance on tourism in particular. Because, because of COVID, tourism basically dead. Some Caribbean countries were forced to open too soon, and so they are feeling the repercussions of opening too soon and having you know, more COVID cases. You look at Barbados, look at um, St. Lucia. But some of the other in some of the other services include financial services, banking sector, and you know there was a point in time where the, the American government was coming down hard on certain Caribbean countries because they were facilitating offshore banking, and a lot of companies in America would hide their taxes. They would call tax haven, hide their taxes in certain countries, Bahamas and Cayman Islands and those kind of places because we. We, we were using our our islands as nice banking financial services. And so the, gov the American government was like, you know, they're going to blacklist certain countries who are deemed as tax havens. And so, you know, our citizens can come with our visa or they're not going to give us any visa, green cards, stuff like that. Certain, certain agreements would be pulled back, you know, things like that. So relying too heavily and even in the financial sector can be detrimental to any Caribbean country but that's a service that's that's been booming even if you do it the legal way it's still a lucrative service transportation and things like that a lot of our Caribbean countries became hubs for certain airlines and things like that certain courier services would come to the Caribbean and use as a, a hub to go elsewhere and stuff like that so those are some of the examples of the service sector that the Caribbean you know has been able to use to generate some funds tourism 
one of the big earners in the smaller Caribbean countries, you know, your Antigua, your St. Kitts, you know, St. Lucia, those places. So that's, and, and we see, as we said before, took a major hit when COVID, COVID came around. So some advantages of, of our involvement in the tertiary sector, generates foreign exchange, especially from tourism. We know that, self-explanatory. Create jobs, especially because the sector is mostly labor intensive. The sector does not depend heavily on primary products and so would not deplete the country's natural resources. So it rely mostly on human resource and so it doesn't de deplete the natural resources. As mentioned, the sector contributes to gross domestic product of the countries, less pollution generated when compared with the primary and secondary sectors. So to me, a lot of these advantages seem rather superficial, you know, because of the nature of services. But of course, generates foreign exchange, especially from tourism. You know, you have your planes coming in, everybody wants sun and sand. And so we rely on that a little heavily, but we got some good earnings from that. Another one you can see is where Caribbean countries are selling, you know, citizen by investment. So you invest in the country and you can buy a passport to become a citizen in that country. And so we see that really booming in a lot of the smaller islands. And of course, it's less labor intensive. And so a lot of the people who are not working in agriculture tend to, you have um, the service industry taking up a lot of persons like that, especially the hotel and the, you know, the hospitality sector. They take up a lot of workers. You see a hotel out, out I mean, staffing up for a lot of people, a lot of people. That's why you see the countries were hit so hard when the tourism sector went down because a lot of our, pers our people working in that sector. And of course, the financial sector basically dried up to a certain degree when you had things like the financial crisis back in the day, or even now with COVID, because a lot of companies were losing a lot of profits and monies because people not working. And so those are, so like I said, these are some of the most superficial advantages. Less pollution, of course, that's a good one, but less pollution compared with the primary and secondary sector is people, is the human capital, and so you don't generate a lot of greenhouse gases like agriculture or things like that. But disadvantages. Service as a whole are very volatile and so may not be sustainable, and that is the truth. Service industries are very volatile. The least thing happen, you see them slump. Again, can't stress this enough, COVID, perfect example of how service, industry, service industries are so volatile and not sustainable. The financial crash that they had before, a lot of money was stopped coming in into certain countries because companies are making the money. So again, that shows how volatile the service industry is. The least thing can cause a negative impact on the services that are being offered. Like I said before, the, the US government cracked down on uh, tax havens, and as such, that industry took a pounding um, in the past few years. It may require high training costs to ensure that the service being offered is the same regardless of location. Services such as tourism can impact a country's culture and values and may lead to change in the people's social behavior. Again, this one, a little more deeper than you would find in POB. So this tourist industry, they are saying that it can lead to culture changes and values. All of a sudden, persons are more materialistic. They're more focusing on more American-style things. Even the food, things like that, might change. But then again, you know, even though it's a disadvantage, it might be an advantage in terms of, you know, some, some consumer-friendly you know, services might actually make persons more friendly towards locals because sometimes you go to a bank or a hotel, you know, you greet them with a smile because they already train in that regard. But that's beside the point. But the service industries can, you know, change a country's culture and may lead to changing people's social behavior. All of a sudden, persons are more into, you know, money and want to invest in stock market because they see that as a thing that they would have seen on TV or they would have been influenced by the, finan the, the tax havens and those kind of things. So they become more money grabbing and stuff and things like that. Your values might be corrupted. Your way of life might be corrupted because of tourism. You see a lot of countries used to have certain diets and then when the American influence start coming on, you see all the KFCs and the Burger Kings and all these things popping up and then your, 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 your diet started to change for the worse. And, and you see those things being displayed. You see a lot of the, the, um, 
people emulating a more American style things in the Caribbean to our detriment, you know, the bloods and quips and the gang and you know, things like that. So the tourism sector can impact your country's culture in a negative way. You know, some people might th see it as being, you know, service serve in servitude to the white man. A lot of people don't really like that. That our people still got to be waiting hand and foot on foreigners and the white man and things like that. You have to write too much on the white dollar, a lot of stuff like that. So all those are psychological things that certain services can impact our citizens. All right. And so, like I said before, MOB, you have to go more in depth. You have to be more, you have to think more outside the box. And so that's a key difference between this and POB. You have to go and explain a lot of things, the real world things happening in the Caribbean, happening around you. All right. So that's it end of the first mob lecture and look it's really a lecture a lot of talking going on here because it's really a lecture and so that's the end of that we're going to jump in next time looking at the economic sector and legal structures and you would see that these are things we covered in pob we're looking at you know sole trader and things like that but of course again a little more in depth a little more a little more nuance a little a different a different slant on the same concepts right a little deeper delve into the concepts okay so make sure you like the video make sure you subscribe to the channel make sure you hit the notification bell so you know when learn skn drops the next mob video lecture video all right thanks for watching thanks for listening